Cancer is an equity imperative. We must close the cancer divide. We know that the poor suffer from cancer, just as do the rich, only the poor suffer more, both in terms of exposure to risk factors, infection-associated cancers, treatable cancers that generate death and disability that gets unnecessary and preventable, but also the stigma and discrimination and the pain and suffering tend to be concentra concentrated among the poor. And this means that there's a cancer divide that has to be closed, a moral and an equity imperative. Globally, we know that there are causes mostly associated for women and death with chronic and non-communicable disease. And that means that diabetes, heart disease, and cancers are right on the top. In the Latin America and Caribbean subregion, we know that breast cancer, for example, is the number two cause in the majority of countries of death among young women aged 30 to 54. That's the case in Mexico and several other countries. And cervical cancer is the third, fourth, or fifth still in many countries of the world. The, we face a series of barriers in being able to take advantage of the opportunities to be able to save lives, and there are huge opportunities for poor women that are dying of breast and cervical cancers today. The barriers are many, but most of them are not, in fact, economic. And PAHO has done some tremendous work through its strategic fund in making it true that there's increased access. There are barriers related to access that often are associated with transportation, that are often associated with inequities, and that are too often associated with the machismo that we know is a societal cancer that truly does affect the region. We can call it stigma, we can call it gender discrimination, we can call it machismo, it is indeed the same thing. It's a barrier that too many women face in coming forward or trying to come forward to be able to detect on time, particularly a breast and also a cervical cancer. We know from working in the region, myself as someone who lives with breast cancer, that I hear too many women after I've completed the story and explained to them how important it is to have a breast self-examination done, yourself to know your body, to have a clinical examination done on a regular basis, and to go to mammography. I finish the story, and the women tell me they won't go. And they won't go because their fear is a fear of abandonment, typically by their male partners or husbands, and then being left alone to care for that family and their children. We hear it over and over again. And my husband, Julio Frank, former Minister of Health of Mexico, has said that this is a societal cancer, the cancer of machismo, a terrible barrier that women are facing in being able to have better access to care. So I believe that cancer is an issue of survivorship, that we live with it for the rest of our lives once you've been diagnosed. And I also believe that we can become cancer thrivers, which means that we can contribute in many ways because of the knowledge and insights that this disease tends to give us, but also the voice. There's a huge voice, particularly with breast cancer, that gives us a tremendous responsibility to contribute to improving access for the many who don't. But I would say that this can't be only a voice that's devoted to our own cancers or our own disease. We have here a responsibility and an opportunity to have particularly breast cancer thrivers contribute to promoting issues such as more gender equality, more access overall to health care, and social development, particularly in our own countries and regions, in this case Latin America and the Caribbean. No one of us can solve these issues. That is why we have to have a multi-sectoral approach to be able to solve the problems that women are facing in terms of cancer and overall the cancer divide. This is an issue that requires government, ministries, but also ministries of finance, ministries of education, even ministries of transport. It requires solutions that are regional and global and institutions like the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization, working with institutions like the World Bank. We require civil society clearly. That's where voices and that's how we can often reach these people. We require communities because it requires a community voice and access through the community to women and to families. And we also have to be able to influence men who must be part of the solution. And this is often done at the level of the community and the level of voice. We need the media to be able to make this a disease that can be discussed and therefore confronted effectively. And we need ourselves, those of us who live with the disease, to stand up openly and show that we can thrive, we can get through treatment, we can continue to do what we need to do for our home, for our families, for our communities, and also for our societies. The economic cost of inaction in cancer is much greater than the economic cost of action. We know that it costs about 2 to 4 percent of global GDP per year to do nothing about cancer. We know that tobacco, for example, costs the world 3.6% of global GDP every year. 
We also know that there are prevention interventions and treatment interventions that are cost effective and we can manage to do, particularly in a region like Latin America and the Caribbean, and that the overall savings, because of avoidable mortality, if we invest more and better in prevention and treatment for cancers, and particularly those of women and children, would be in the billions. Well, as the new director, Dr. Carissa Tien, spoke about today, confronting cancer and women's cancers in the region is an opportunity, but one that requires us all to work together in a multi-stakeholder, in a multi-institutional solution that includes everyone from patients to governments to global and regional institutions and to the private sector without any question. We have to all be part of making a solution and a solution that can count not just for cancer but for strengthening health systems and achieving universal coverage overall. To date, I have to say that the Global Task Force and Expanded Access to Cancer Care and Control has worked very closely with PAHO, particularly um, in learning from and working with the staff that have been so incredible in the regional level at generating a strategic fund that today includes many drugs for chronic and non-communicable illnesses. It's unique in the world, PAHO's strategic fund for this, and we've worked very closely with many within the institution and throughout the institution, all levels of staff, with the Global Task Force to be able to promote increased access. The forum that PAHO is launching today for the region in breast and cervical cancer is, is truly unique. First, because we're including cervical cancer as well as breast. Second, because of the range of actors that we see in the room, not only representing so many countries in the regions, but also different sectors, private sector, government, civil society, patients, advocates of all types. And uniquely, linking both Latin America, Spanish-speaking Latin America, Portuguese-speaking Latin America, and also French and English-speaking Caribbean and Latin America. That is incredibly unusual and a tremendous opportunity for us all to be able to move forward. I'm very happy as the Harvard Global Equity Initiative, representing the Global Task Force and Expanded Access to Cancer, and also as a founder and director of Tomate Lo Pecho, a civil society NGO dedicated to work on breast cancer, and the Mexican Health Foundation, to be able to participate with PAHO in this initiative. Breast and cervical cancer have to be a battle that we are able to win. Um, we can't leave aside cervical cancer because this has become a disease from which only or almost only poor women die. There are so many different interventions um, that go from vaccination for young women, for young girls, on to different treatment. Um, in breast cancer, it's often a more complex disease to be able to treat because we don't know how to do primary prevention. We cannot leave aside cervical cancer because we would be leaving aside a disease that tends to kill particularly poor women and one about which we know we can do something. We know we can not only cure is not the issue. In fact, we know we can prevent this disease. And many countries of the region have taken up this battle, including access to the HPV vaccine that's been made so possible with the PAHO Strategic Fund. Just recently, for example, included in the Seguro Popular in Mexico for all young women in, uh, in high school age and junior high school age. So we have to be doing both. And that's part of, a, I think, a broader message, which is that we should not be advocating only on behalf of our own disease. You survive one disease to confront another, you triage many people through a health system, and we have to look at individuals and look at human faces, look at women, children, and men as well, and their need for access to care. Our responsibility, those of us who have cancer, is to be able to do that. My message to women regarding breast cancer is we have to come forward. You must be knowing your own body, that's part of our responsibilities, insisting on clinical breast exam every time you go for your annual checkup, beginning mammography at age 40 every two years, and if there's any history of breast cancer in your family, it is very important to share that with your physician. That kind of basic information can be taken at the primary level of care and can truly help to save your life. So you must come forward in order to avoid more aggressive treatment and in order to be there for our family. Often we forget to take care of ourselves. We take care of our children, we take care of our partners, we take care of our communities, but we forget to take care of ourselves. It's part of our responsibility and part of our opportunity to care for our own health. And I'll also say to all of the women who are listening and participating in this sort of a movement that it is our responsibility 
to be able to strengthen our health systems, to be able to work towards universal health care for all, to think beyond our own disease, and to think of ourselves if we've suffered a disease like cancer, that we're empowered to do something for many, many women and many, many people who are part of our communities. And thank you very much to Paco for making this possible.